et démocratie, mia pire et ai. Eleutheros ta prosto koinon, politu omen. Lego kein heita holi, teis helados, hai juicing eina. Athens wasn't the only polis or city-state that had a democracy. There were around 1,000 city-states or polis in the Greek-speaking world. I'll discuss the term polis in some detail in the next lecture. And perhaps as many as half were democracies. Many democracies emerged in the 5th century, some imposed by Athens when she had an empire, and no two would have been exactly identical. The other preferred system of government was oligarchy, ruled by the few. And since the few could number in the thousands, we should therefore think of a shifting scale from oligarchy to democracy rather than to opposed systems. Athens, so far as we know, was the most extreme, the most radical and the most developed kind of democracy. It's also the only one that has left us something that resembles a recorded history, despite all the gaps in our knowledge. So we're pretty much forced to be Athenocentric while acknowledging the possibility that other city-states were, if not equally extreme, fairly radical. And other leading contenders are Argos and Corinth in the Peloponnese and Syracuse in Sicily. In addition to democracy and oligarchy, the Greek world knew two other systems of government, tyranny and kingship. Kingship had largely been eliminated by the 6th century, except in Sparta and Macedon. Tyranny intermittently flourished throughout Greek history, though its heyday was in the 7th and 6th century. Sparta, Athens's nemesis in the Peloponnesian War, was unusual in that it exhibited what we would call a mixed constitution. It had a dual kingship, that's to say two kings, an oligarchic element in the form of a council of 30 elders known as the Gerousia and an assembly of all the citizens known as the Appella. The earliest evidence of democracy in the Greek world is to be found in the work of the epic poet Homer dated 725 to 700 BC. In the Odyssey, one of the things that distinguishes the Cyclopes the giants with a singular circular eye, which makes them uncivilized, is the fact that they don't have assemblies in which advice is given. In other words, they aren't Democrats with a small d. And they don't have any laws either. Each one, we're told, is a law unto himself. Both in the Iliad and in the Odyssey, we see democratic assemblies taking place. They prove that many of the features of Athenian democracy were already in place as early as the late 8th century BC. There's much more to it than that, however. Homer depicts debates going on before our eyes in a fully realized way that I find totally convincing. He puts us right in the center of the assembly so that we feel acutely the tensions and the passions. There's hardly anything comparable in the whole of Greek literature. At the very beginning of Iliad Book I, a wartime assembly of the Achaeans, that's to say the, the Greeks encamped around the walls of Troy, takes place. The assembly has been called by the hero Achilles, the foremost fighter on the Achaean side. Note that it's not been called by Agamemnon, the commander-in-chief of the Achaean army. A plague has broken out and has been raging for nine days. In the assembly, Achilles recommends that they consult a seer to find out why Apollo is angry. Apollo was the god who caused plagues. And a certain Calchas, an interpreter of omens, agrees to reveal the cause of Apollo's anger on condition that Achilles affords him protection. That's because he knows what he's going to say will offend Agamemnon. Achilles agrees to protect him, and Calchas explains that Apollo is angry because Agamemnon has refused to accept ransom for the daughter of his priest, whom he is now sleeping with. 
When he hears this, Agamemnon becomes furious. He castigates the priest and says if he has to give up the girl, her name is Chryseis, he demands that he receive another girl in compensation. Agamemnon even goes so far as to say that he lusts after Chryseis more than he does after his wife Clytemnestra. Not a statement calculated to endear him with the army or with Homer's audience or indeed with Clytemnestra, who incidentally will murder him on his return from the war. That upsets the apple cart because there's no spare girl to go around and someone will have to give up his prize to satisfy him. We've already distributed all the girls, so that would be breaking the rules, Achilles objects. That was the rule in the Achaean army and no doubt in reality as well, captured girls were awarded as prizes. That's not a problem, Agamemnon says. I'll just seize Ajax's girl or Odysseus's girl or yours. And now an almighty row breaks out between Agamemnon and Achilles, both of them trading insults, insults every bit as abusive as anything we hear today in the realm of politics. Achilles all but draws his sword and kills his commander-in-chief on the spot, but is warned off by the goddess Athena, who swoops down and pulls him by the hair. Eventually, Achilles dashes his scepter to the ground and sits down, fuming. The Greek word is skeptron, and it gives us our word scepter. Anyone who addresses the assembly is given it, indicating that he holds the floor. The elderly Nestor then gets up and tries to pour oil on troubled waters by placating both sides. The assembly ends with Achilles agreeing to give up Briseis, his war prize, but warning Agamemnon that if he tries to take anything else of his, he'll kill him. He also announces that he is withdrawing from the battlefield effective immediately. It seems the leading champion can take himself out of uh, hostilities and not face court-martial. So, this is the first example of democracy at work in Western literature, and it's not a very flattering picture. Tempers run so high that the debate all but ends in a bloodbath. Homer had no doubt witnessed meetings that ended this way when the stakes were very high as they were here. So there's nothing new under the sun. Brawls in democratic assemblies are not uncommon. A few years before the outbreak of the Civil War, a senator called Charles Sumner was nearly beaten to death on the floor of the Senate by his pro-slavery opponent. It took him three years to recover. And the reason the distance between the government and opposition benches is what it is in the British House of Commons is because the two parties are just out of sword reach of each other should one MP take it into his head to lash out at the other. And to cite a contemporary example, Taiwan's legislative Yuan frequently erupts in violence with punching, hair pulling and splashing cups of water on the faces of fellow parliamentarians being the order of the day. A second assembly takes place soon afterwards in Book Two of the Iliad, when Agamemnon is testing the resolve of the army. Beforehand, he holds a meeting of his council, the equivalent of what in later times was called the boule. In fact, that is precisely the word that Homer uses, which indicates conclusively that the poet, or poets, we don't know if Homer was one person, was familiar with democratic practice. Meetings of the boule, a council of 500 citizens elected by lot, took place in Athens prior to meetings of the assembly from the late 6th century onwards. Agamemnon explains to his council of senior officers that he is summoning an assembly of the Achaean army because he wants to test its resolve. He's going to suggest that they should abandon the siege of Troy and return home. He doesn't really want that outcome, however. In reality, he wants to put a proposal before the army that he hopes it will reject. It's rather like a British prime minister calling an election to see if she or he can get a bigger mandate. It's a calculated move and it's self-seeking. Agamemnon gets the backing of the council, the heralds summon the army and everyone takes his seat. There's a lot of rowdiness, however, and it takes nine heralds circulating around to quarten the army down. 
And then Agamemnon rises, holding the scepter, which, as we've seen, symbolizes his right to speak. And he announces that he's had a message from Zeus, telling him that he wants him to call the expedition off. As Agamemnon is commander-in-chief, we might think he has the right to order the army what to do, but he evidently wants or perhaps needs their consent. However, uh, when he says deceitfully that he wants to abandon the siege of Troy, it turns out, unsurprisingly, that there's a sizable proportion of his army that agrees with him. In fact, Odysseus goes around bullying into silence anyone who has the gall to support the proposal. Whenever he saw a man of the demos, i.e. a commoner, shouting, Odysseus strikes him. He actually strikes him and orders him to shut up and listen to his betters, the aristocrats. I'm assuming, though I don't know for certain, that no one ever got struck in the Athenian assembly if he was out of line, but who knows? Odysseus has just managed to settle the assembly when Thersites, a common soldier, gets up and says, that's a great idea. The war is pointless. Let's go back home and get on with our lives. What makes his intervention all the more striking is that he's not only a commoner, but also deformed. He's bandy-legged, hunchbacked, lame, and has a deformed head. Now, people who were deformed in ancient Greece were stigmatized. There was a belief that you were rejected by the gods. Teras, often translated monster, was also someone who was congenitally deformed. And this is a man who has the courage to stand up and say what is surely on a lot of people's minds now that Achilles has withdrawn from the fighting. He's saying, haven't you grabbed enough loot by now of Agamemnon? Or do you still hunger after more gold? Or perhaps you are lusting after yet another girl to go to bed with? In other words, what on earth is the point of this war? It's a question many soldiers demand of their political masters. Then Thersites tells his comrades to leave Agamemnon where he is to enjoy his plunder and head back home. Well, by now, Odysseus has heard enough and he knows the fellow is dangerous. If he's not careful, he'll persuade the army to mutiny. So he sidles up to Thersites and tells him he's a good speaker, a ligus agoretes. And that's high praise coming from Odysseus, who was known as the best of the speakers in the Achaean army. But he has no right to abrade his betters, Odysseus says, the basileus, the kings, or even to address the assembly. Odysseus even threatens to whip the Cites, but in the end he settles for striking him with the scepter, with, with the scepter, no less. That's got to be a violation of the rules. Homer tells us that the Deimos was upset by this, but they laughed anyway and praised Odysseus for silencing the braggart. They evidently didn't have the guts to defend him. So, what does this tell us about Greek democracy as envisaged by Homer? That it's pretty dysfunctional, even though the army is consulted, or at least informed, that it begins with an attempt to mislead it by presenting fake news, as we might call it, uh, the false claim by Agamemnon that Zeus has indicated they can't win the war, and it ends with physical violence perpetrated against the speaker. But there's more to it than that. And this is a more subtle point. There's at least the hint of a challenge to aristocratic privilege because the Cites has the chutzpah and is actually speaking sound common sense. What are we doing nearly 10 years down the road fighting for the return of an unfaithful woman, Helen? Hundreds, if not thousands, have died for this woman. What's the logic in that, he demands? Thersis Ites may get a beating, but there's a strong likelihood that he was already a familiar figure in Homer's day, the commoner who wouldn't shut up. Motor mouth. Uh, the Greeks actually had a word for that, ametroepes, measureless of speech, the man who wasn't to be cowed. The Cambridge ancient historian Paul Cartledge says that Homer's message was unambiguous. Do not even think of challenging the political status quo. I would suggest that Homer's message is not quite so straightforward. It's true 
Uh, society is not only silenced, but also humiliated for his pains. But he's made his point. And though Homer's aristocratic audience may have applauded the beating he receives, uh, just as the Achaean army applauds, men like Thersites were already a political reality by the end of the 8th century BC. So, it's quite possible that the silence of him represents a kind of wish fulfillment in an aristocratic society that is already beginning to face challenges from the common man. And there's one last point to make about these wartime assemblies. They're taking place in wartime. Can you imagine any army commander deciding strategy by means of a vote of the whole army? Admittedly, no vote actually takes place in either of the assemblies we've discussed, but that's because none is necessary. Agamemnon gets his way on both occasions. But there's at least the threat of his policy being overturned. And on the first occasion, it's Achilles, remember, who calls the assembly because soldiers are dying from the plague, have been for nine days, and Agamemnon hasn't done a thing about it. This is an inherently democratic society, even if democracy is deeply flawed. In the Iliad, we encounter two wartime assemblies. In the Odyssey, we encounter a peacetime assembly. In Book 2, Odysseus's son Telemachus, on his own initiative, calls an assembly to complain about his mother's suitors, 108 of them, no less, who are squatting in his father, Odysseus's palace, importuning um, Penelope, his wife, to marry one of them against her will, and feasting and drinking at his expense. Telemachus orders heralds to pass the word to the long-haired Achaeans, i.e. to the male population of Ithaca, and they arrive the same day, it seems. And the assembly is held in the Agora. The Agora was an open space in the centre of the city where people could gather both formally and informally, roughly square in shape. You need such a space to have democracy, a space large enough to accommodate the citizen body. The Agora in Athens lay to the north of the Acropolis. It was the civic, legal, political, religious and commercial heart of the city. It was finally cleared of modern buildings in the 1930s and is still being excavated by the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. It's yielded a great deal of information about Athenian democracy. The verb agoriouen, whose root is agora, means to speak in public. The agora was no doubt where the Athenian assembly met originally, until the citizen body became too big and meetings had to be held elsewhere on the Panix, a hill to the west of the Acropolis. A Panix, by the way, means squeeze together, a graphic description of what it would have been like, a cheek to jowl with your neighbours. So, back now to the Odyssey. There, there hasn't been an assembly on Ithaca since Odysseus left some 20 years ago. Even so, everyone remembers how an assembly is conducted. They all sit down, and Telemachus sits in the seat assigned to his father. The oldest man, his name is Egyptius, speaks first because seniority takes precedence. Telemachus hasn't given any reason for calling the assembly, nor indeed did the herald say it was he who was calling it. Uh, we know that because Egyptius is totally in the dark, both about who summoned the assembly and why. He opens the meeting by asking if someone has heard news of the return of the men they sent to fight in the Trojan War, or whether some public matter, the adjective he uses is daimios, which means relating to the daimos, needs to be discussed. These were the most obvious reasons for holding a, a meeting on Ithaca at this date. Then he compliments the anonymous man who summoned the assembly and prays to Zeus that it will have a good outcome for him. Egyptius is the person in charge of the proceedings, it seems, like the chairman in the Athenian assembly, and a debate now follows. Telemachus rises and takes his stand in the middle of the agora, and a herald hands him the scapetron, signaling, as we've seen, that he has the floor. He explains he has summoned the assembly, 
He hasn't any news to relay, however, nor is it about some public business. He has a private grievance. He's upset by the way the suitors are treating him and his mother. So he formally supplicates Zeus, quote, who summons and dissolves assemblies, a telling phrase that shows that assemblies came under the protection of the chief Olympian deity. And he politely requests that the suitors leave him and his mother alone. It's a very emotional speech. And at the end, Telemachus bursts into tears. And he also throws a scepter on the ground, just as Achilles does. No one, no one laughs at him, however, and no one censors him. On the contrary, we're told that pity overcame the people. Eventually, Antinous, one of the suitors, gets up and starts blaming Penelope, Telemachus' mother, for refusing to choose one of the suitors as her husband. And he declares that they won't leave Odysseus's palace till she does. Antinous has raised the stakes, and the debate now becomes more heated. He berates Telemachus and calls upon Zeus to destroy him. And at this, Zeus sends two eagles flying over the much-talking agora. That's to say the agora where much is talked about and discussed. And now an aged seer called Halitherses interprets the omen in Odysseus's favour, prophesying that Odysseus will one day return home. Another suitor called Eurymachus now rises. He belittles Halitherses, ridicules his prophecy, and urges Telemachus to persuade his mother again to choose one of the suitors. And then Telemachus resides, rises again. He says he's given up trying to persuade the suitors to mend their ways, and he requests, evidently at public expense, a ship and 20 companions so he can sail to the Greek mainland to discover his father's whereabouts. A character called Mentor, who is actually Athena in disguise, now rises and chides the assembly for not having the guts to put the suitors in their place. And last to speak is a suitor called Leocritus, who upbraids Mentor for speaking out of turn. And he then breaks up the assembly, presumably by making a motion to adjourn, which the majority accept. So, passions have been aroused and a heated exchange has taken place. But no resolution has been reached, and there is no motion to revisit the topic at a later date. So Telemachus has achieved very little, apart from taking a courageous stand and trying to right a wrong. And that is always important, of course. He's like any young man who stands up and defends a point of principle in a public space. It takes a lot of guts, and it shows he's becoming a man. It's what we call his maiden speech, and we can be confident it will be remembered. Every young Athenian who stood up in the assembly for the first time went through a similar rite of passage and would surely have identified with Telemachus. It must have been pretty terrifying addressing a meeting of perhaps five or six thousand citizens. I think Homer does a very fine job of putting us in Telemachus's sandals and imagining what it must have been like addressing the assembly for the first time, facing criticism from the old hands and hoping that someone like Halitherses or mentor would take your side. We've all been there, or at least many Athenians had. So, three points to make. First, although the only people who speak are the Basileis, the kings, the assembly is attended by the demos. We know that because mentor uses that word when he is upbraiding those in attendance for staying stum not supporting Telemachus, even though they are many and the suitors are few. Since the suitors number 108, 
we are presumably to think of attendance around the thousand mark or more. Second, the subject of the debate has nothing to do with what is in the public interest. It's a purely private matter, but it gets discussed anyway. It's not entirely clear what Telemachus hopes to gain by calling the assembly. What action is he expecting it to take? Does he want it to act as a court and censor the suitors? We don't know. Third, it's not clear what part the demos, the commons, play in the proceedings. Are they there merely to listen and perhaps to applaud or boo? And if a vote had been taken, how would it have been registered? By a show of hands? Probably that was the way that it happened in Athenian democracy. Like the Iliad, the Odyssey also provides evidence of the fact that, in addition to the assembly, the Greeks of the late 8th, early 7th century were also familiar with how a council worked. In Book 1, the gods take their seats in Zeus's palace on Mount Olympus. The first to speak is Zeus, who opens the proceedings by complaining that the gods are being blamed for things they can't control. That's to say, human folly which brings its own punishment. And after he's had his rant, Athena speaks. Yes, yes, you're right, she says, but I want to discuss the case of Odysseus. He's a good man and he sacrifices to the gods and he's suffering. Have you forgotten all about him? No, Zeus replies, far from it. But you'll recall he did blind Poseidon's son, the one I jant Polyphemus, so he's only got himself to blame for his troubles. But uh, OK, let's discuss how to bring him back home. So great, says Athena. I suggest you send the messenger Hermes to the nymph Calypso and order her to release Odysseus. Odysseus is Calypso's sex slave. Um, he wants to return to Ithaca, but she won't let him. Now, of course, this isn't a typical council in any usual sense of the word. It's more like a meeting of the mafia. Athena manages to get her way because one of the members of the council who is opposed to her proposal, Poseidon, isn't in attendance. Anyone who's ever served on a committee knows how important it can be to wait until your opponent is absent if you want to push a controversial measure through. And that is exactly what Athena does. To conclude, this is poetry. We shouldn't assume that 7th century Greece would follow the same pattern as the one described by Homer. But Homer's description strongly suggests that democracy had a formal structure as early as 700 BC. And indeed, how could it function otherwise? And just one last point before we, we leave Homer. I think it's pretty clear that he had serious reservations about democracy. But I think it's also striking that democratic assemblies take place at the beginning of both the Iliad and the Odyssey. It's it's almost as if Homer is saying, this is how we do things, because we are Greeks. The origins of democracy are contentious. Paul Cartledge points to the recent trend among some scholars to dethrone the primacy of Greece as the place where democracy started and to posit instead a secret history of democracy. And these scholars suggest that democracy had its roots in China, India and the Middle East, and that it continued to exist in the Islamic world, in Iceland, in Venice and in pre-colonial Africa, when most of Europe was in the throes of the Dark Ages. One of the leading advocates of this position is the Nobel laureate Amartya Sen, who claimed that democracy is, I quote, not a quintessentially Western idea. Well, this is a very big topic and not one that we can explore here. Partly, it's fueled by the desire to topple Western civilization from its privileged position as the exemplar of all that is most admirable in terms of cultural and political development. I respect this position to some degree, but not when it does violence to the facts. Now, it's, it's certainly true that many other societies have evinced democratic characteristics but it also has to be acknowledged that none, so far as we know, has exhibited the same thoroughgoing confidence 
in the common man, as Greece, especially Athens, did. And that, in the words of Robert Frost in his poem, The Road Not Taken, has made all the difference. <laughs>